Well, good morning, and thank you to everyone for joining uh, us today. I'm Mark Cortade, the Executive Director of the Huntington Arts Council, and welcome to our Arts Administrative Forum. Today's topic is called Building Equity and Social Justice Through the Arts. Thank you to the panelists uh, uh, for being with us. Thank you all for registering and taking part in this. Um, I'll, I'll do a Quick, we will get back to it shortly, but our panel today is Joycetta Pierce, who we're still waiting to sign in, I believe. She's the manager of the African American Museum of Nassau County. We have Milady Gonzalez, who's the program associate bilingual facilitator at Her Story. Minerva Perez, who is the executive director of Ola, Eastern Long Island. Napoleon Rev Revels Bay, who is Artistic Director and Jubilation Fellow, Nassau Performing Arts and Revels Bay Music. And um, moderating today will be Patty Al Hayek, one of our artist members, um, all terrific people in their own right. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Executive Director, I get to do the, um, I call this the PBS part of it. I, I need to make some thanks to um, our funders for making this possible, the New York State Council on the Arts through our general operating program, uh, Suffolk County Office of Cultural and Cultural Affairs, and the Town of Huntington for their support. Um, these forums are roundtable discussions for not-for-profit artist administrators and educators, and we offer some technical assistance as well as networking opportunities to aid organizations and artists. The forums provide the opportunity to explore strengths and challenges of the field and exchange information. Uh, this morning, uh, events will feature established and emerging leaders in the arts administrative fields and focus on topics that are presenting challenges to us right now. Mm -hmm. um, just to give you an idea, this was normally we would be doing this in our Main Street gallery, and this was part of expanding the gallery concept, bringing people into a gallery that wouldn't normally go to a gallery. Unfortunately, I'm, we're not doing that right now. I'm from the comforts of my kitchen. A lot of you, I believe, are from the comforts of home or, or where have you, and that's just the nature of the beast right now. But if you're in Huntington, uh, come in and check the gallery. We have the current show, which is called In a New Light, which is a non-juried exhibition of works based on artists bringing positivity and hope for the upcoming year. I could use a little right now. So come in and enjoy that. Um, that's up through January 30th. And our next show is a juried show. It's called Paradoxical Paradigms. Check the website about that. Uh, the juror is Kristen Cuomo from the Long Island Museum uh, in Stony Brook. That will open February 5th. We also do a program similar to forums called Conversations in the Arts, and that's um, really artists talking to artists about art forms. This is more about organizations talking uh, uh, about programming, et cetera, et cetera, um, that they are doing. Uh, the next Conversation in the Arts on February 11th at 7 p.m., that's a Thursday, um, was a call to a community. We do put it out and a couple people respond. Um, uh, Dr. Nichelle Rivers uh, put together a really fantastic um, uh, panel for us. And it's, the, the topic is going to be anti-racism and inequality. She's got uh, Alicia Evans, who's an art educator and artist. Lauren Gonzalez, who is an art teacher and artist. Ebony Thompson, who's a visual artist, uh, will be joining us. Um, the next Arts Administrative Forum will be in April, and that will be on mentoring and um, assistance that is out there for, for us all that maybe we just need a reminder sometimes. Um, I've got Renee Flagler from exec uh, the Executive Director of Girls Inc. on Long Island as a panelist, along with Felicity Hogan, who is the Director of New York Foundation for the Arts Learning, Therese Nielsen from the Huntington Public Library, and they have the, uh, the fundraising software um, that you all should know about and know how to use. We're all desperate for funds. Don't go for the same people I'm going for. But, um, <laughs> and uh, that the moderator on that will be Ama Yawson, who's uh, one of our artist members, a founder and president and principal of Miles Tales. Um, as always, donations are welcomed. And right now, as we all know, we are just desperate for these things. I mean, funding is hard. Uh, how do they say, in, in Sweeney Todd, Mrs. Lovett says, times is hard. They sure are right now. Uh, so 
any donations, any which way. Tell your friends if they win the lottery, fund Huntington Arts Council and I will promise to do <laughs> um, some arts funding for uh, our, the organizations and artists in Suffolk and Nassau counties. Um, and until then, we're, we're all in this together. We're all hanging in there. Um, I will turn this over to our panelists right now. Um, Patty, I will let you lead this. I'm going to say one thing here. This is a conversation in the arts. Leave politics out of this, please. That's not what we're here to talk about. I will mute you if I need you to. Let's talk about our arts experiences and what we're doing and, and try to keep it in a positive frame of light and, and you know, or a more forward thinking way. So go with it. Actually, before we get started, um, I do notice Leanne Tintori from the New York State Council of the Arts is here. Do you want to say anything uh, about this or are you? I'm just here to listen in. You know, we've been doing ourselves a lot of a lot of work around diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Uh, NISCA itself has undergone um, all all during the fall um, a whole training series of of uh, trainings uh, with Donna Walker Kuhn, um, and it, it's really been enlightening. Um, we've done it through our DEC program, which Mark and his team participated in, um, and it I, I think. Uh, I think it's fair to say that it will definitely have um, uh, a place, a, prior, a, a prioritized place in our funding for FY 2022. I think uh, we're in the process of um, revising really all of our guidelines and, and, and our funding structure, much as we did with DEC, Mark. We really are looking to uh, to not jettison entirely our structure of 50 or 60 years, but to really make, uh, make it lots simpler, lots more accessible, and lots more relevant to what's happening now in all of our work lives and personal lives. So expect radical changes, um, but definitely the DEI work will have uh, primacy in, in all of that. All of our uh, evaluation will really be lensed through a DEI perspective. And we really are looking um, for organizations who may be serving in really racially homogenous areas to really think about the programming that they're presenting to their audiences to really just basically throw the net a lot wider. And then of course, we're also looking at board and staff and the process that in the long slow process that all of us uh, of our organizations um, will hopefully embark upon to really diversify. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of, of uh, where NISCA is and I think where the whole world is at this point. So I'm really glad, that's why I'm sitting here. I'm really glad to see to see you guys doing it. So thanks Mark for taking that on. No, you're welcome. And I, I think while NISCA was planning the, their their sessions for the, this summer, I was planning this at, at roughly yeah. the same time. And I think I, I sort of um, adapted the name from you. You know, <laughs> there, there was, um, oh, how can I say that? Oh, they, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. You guys yeah, said it. That's how I feel too. Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly poaching from everyone else. So anyway, I'm glad to be here. I will only be here until 1130 because I got to jump on uh, the governor's announcing his budget today. Hooray. So I contract. <laughs> like yeah, right. Exactly. Mark's contract. Anyway, so yeah. I'm, I'm here to sit in uh, for just a little while. Unfortunately, we're glad you joined us. Thank, and, you. You know, Thank you. Thank you for having part me. of what this is about so that um, organization can see there is a lot of good programming on Long Island. Um, as far as the Arts Council is concerned, are, are we as diverse as we could be? Probably not. Are we more diverse than we were? Absolutely. And that is in no way, shape or form um, a, a criticism of previous uh, administrations. It's just the nature, you know, you are supposed to evolve over the years. And I'm very proud. And here's Joy Seta coming in right on time. Um, so uh, Patty, I will turn it over to you. Joy Seta, once you're in, if you would unmute your mic and we will get rolling. Take it away, Patty. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, and I'm really happy to be here today and thank you for asking me to moderate. Um, uh, just very quickly, um, introducing myself uh, before we get to introduce the panelists and hear about them. Uh, I am an artist, I'm a visual artist, I'm a multicultural background. Um, I'm also an arts administrator. I have my own program, Art Out of Anything. And I'm also a 2020 NISCA Debt Grant winner from my program, um, A Family of Women. Uh, which tells uh, women's immigration stories. 
um, as an immigrant myself from Colombia, um, I feel very attuned to that um, part of myself and, um, and people like me. So as an other, uh, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here um, talking about equity, um, which is really important. So let's get started. Um, I would like each of the panelists to introduce themselves and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work in the arts as part of the cultural landscape of Long Island. And why don't we start with Milady? So oh, is she frozen? No, uh, yes, she's. I'm on me. <laughs> so hello, my name is Milady Gonzalez and I am the associate, uh, associate uh, program for um, Her Story. I've been with Her Story for two years now and it's been like, a great experience. Um, I started, uh, it's funny how I started with her story because for many, many years, I worked in the business, I worked in hospitals, payroll, uh, in the high schools, and, um, you know, never felt very satisfied. I always felt that there was something missing. So uh, I went back to school, I went to St. Joseph's College, I got a degree in human services, um, because that's what I want to do. I want to be with the community, be with people, help and uh, in any way that I can. So that's how I ended up with um, her story. They did a Freedom uh, Forum, in which they had all these writers, uh, you know, telling their stories. And um, that was part of my internship. I was forced to go there. <laughs> and once I saw the work that they did and what it did to the, to the students and the writers, it's just really, you know, I've been working with them now for two years. So basically her story, um, it's out here in Long Island, but now with everything that's going on is really going like exploding. It's going everywhere, it's nationwide. We have now trainees from um, like South Carolina and, and many different other places. Um, basically we are 25 years old. We're gonna be 25 now in uh, March. And uh, we use memoir as a tool for action. So we host workshops in the communities, in the jails, colleges, universities. Uh, so we bring together all the members, activists, uh, the elderly, the young, dreamers, college students, with the goal to generate the stories that will advance the movement of equity, inclusion, and justice. Thank you. Who's next? Who'd like to volunteer to be next, to introduce themselves? Or am I going to call out your name? Okay. <laughs> How about Napoleon? Tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization. Okay, fine. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. My, my, my earphones were buzzing and stuff. So I don't know what that means. So right now they're working fine. So in any case, uh, I formed a Rebels Bay Music in about 1981, 82. Actually, as I came off the road, I was doing some Broadway shows. Uh, and, and, and then when I came off, I started doing some, I wound up getting arts, doing arts and education programming through Arts Horizons. And through Arts Horizons, I learned how to put together study guides and programs like that to make outreach in the community. Uh, that's what I wanted to do anyway. So my first opportunity actually came because I had a chance to, uh, to sub in the school district, which I didn't really want to do, but uh, I wound up subbing. And so instead of subbing, I wound up doing, uh, you know, playing and sort of entertaining, the, educating the, the students about the music. So the teacher walks in, he says, oh man, that's great, you know, blah, 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 because I wasn't doing the lesson plan. But if you ever get together, come on out and uh, I'll hire you. So we wound up joining BOCES and he was one of the first schools that was in the Hempstead School District. And we did all those school districts in Hempstead uh, by word of mouth and the programming. And then we wound up spreading into New York City schools because I wanted to do more outreach for the city schools. And one of the educators that was in on Long Island knew me and he was in the city school system. So that's how we get into the city school system. So the basic program that I, I wanted to do was an inclusive program um, being of uh, Moorish American. Um, I, I wanted to include the Moors of Spain, West African Bantu rhythms, the Caribbean islands into New Orleans, up to New York, about the music and the art and the combination of different nationalities. So we put together uh, uh, El Andalusia to Dizzy, which became our signature program of which at this point I was able to combine a lot of different uh, communities, uh, make a lot of outreach 
one thing I noticed in the community that when I was in Hempstead, that no one really was addressing those children that came from IE Spanish speaking countries. And I felt that, wow, there's nobody really doing that, you know, and not, not that I was trying to program that specifically, but I wanted to reach as many different nationalities as possibility as possible. Rather. So that's what we did. And right now um, it's extended a little bit uh, into, well, we were doing um, a Morris Sloan Kettering, uh, but because of the COVID, we can't go in. So then I get into the health and healing part of the program. So along the way, I wound up basically writing down some ideas that I wanted to do to help uplift humanity. And they came to fruition. So now we're working, not necessarily medical, but you know, the whole health and wellness that goes along, especially to the time of COVID, you know, where everybody's being confined. Yeah, it's, it's really needed about, uh, I want to do, a, a, you know, get into like meditation and things of that nature, along with the music. I found that, especially with younger people and some of the elder adults, the adults as well, that the music that we play is it, it's cross gender and really cross national, really more cross nationality, because that's always trying to show the connection and to encourage young people that no matter where you come from, no matter what your circumstances are, you can do better. You can do better within yourself, when it doesn't mean you're putting down anyone else, but you need to know who you are and who your ancestors were. So that's the reason why. Um, People know me more less because I'm wearing my fez and stuff. And that's actually happened, just as a quick comment, that happened when I went to a, a arts festival one day. So there was a lady sitting next to me and uh, she was in Indian garb, you know, and, uh, but she wasn't from India. I said, what, that's interesting. She said, well, I like Indian culture. So, so I said, that's interesting. So I ran home and grabbed my fez. <laughs> I'm watch American. So it was a way, I found a way of, of inputting what we do and then along the way, the program grew. You know, there's a lot of different artists that came in. And that's what we're doing now. I guess the Andalusia Dizzy uh, has, has allowed me to, to cross uh, uh, multiple uh, generations as well as cultures. So I, we're definitely a cultural uh, motivated institution in that we want to really empower those. Like I've heard some things about, you know, getting into also the jails, the dreamers. And the, yeah, we want to we want to address that community because they're not being, not so much that they're not being addressed, it's that they, they might need a little help and assistance. So that's what Rebels Bay Music is about. And we're now National Performing Arts Inc., which is uh, the non-for-profit that we formed a couple of years ago. So hopefully I didn't say too much. <laughs> so your artist, your own personal artistic practice really influenced the programming that, you, that you're that you offering. Uh, yeah, and I think also because society, what we're going through in society, be prior to COVID, they dictated that that's what you need to, not me, you, but I needed to do to fulfill what I wanted to do. That's why, like I said earlier, I didn't want to become a teacher uh, in, in the contents that if I had to teach something that I didn't really believe in, then I, I, didn't, I felt that was being a hypocrite. Not only, you know, you gotta know yourself. So when you start knowing who you are, who your ancient forefathers were, you said, well, I don't want to teach that because that's really that archaic stuff that everybody has learned before that is not really true. You know, that's something that, you know, because of unfortunately colonialism, and I'm not trying to get political, but because of colonialism stuff, things have changed. And because of that, is that things are being unraveled now. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, I mean, people use like the, the, the names for, the, for the, the ball teams and stuff. And they say, well, we don't use the Redskins. Yeah, those are things that were embedded culturally that need to be changed. That's, that's offensive. And they're right. You know, so that's what goes on. Thank you, Napoleon. You're welcome. Wonderful. I think, um, and um, I just want to say quickly that um, we're talking about equity. And I think the most important thing in trying to do uh, to fund equitable practices is representation, right? So right now, especially with these panelists, we're seeing that brought to fruition, right? Representing the very community that needs uh, to that we need to build equity for, right? So I think that's a great step in the positive direction. Minerva, are you ready? We'd love to hear from you. Tell us a Good bit. morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty. Uh, it's nice to see everyone. Also, this is uh, you know kind of important, and I'm I'm so excited. I don't care if it's Zoom. I'm just happy to sort of be alive with you all. So, and it's great to hear about the work you're doing. Uh, so, I'm the executive director of Ola of Eastern Long Island. Um, sorry, the lighting is weird. Um, my background is actually theater. Uh, I went to NYU for a theater and uh, had a theater company uh, in the city for about eight years or so. Uh, in, in the West Beth complex there and the West Side by the West Side Highway. And the work that, that I chose to do at that point was all original work and it was all, there was always sort of um, uh, a socially relevant topic, but I, I found that the balance for me is, is a very delicate balance to make sure that 
I wasn't doing like sort of like soapbox theater and forget, forgive me, that's not any kind of a bad thing, except for I knew that I wouldn't bring as much to that. Um, I had to, you know, find theater and find, find pieces that were, that the art shone through so strongly that of definitely there was a message and definitely there was, you know, something else that was coming through, but it had to really be kind of mixed well in, into um, what I thought to be, you know, pretty great writing and, and, and whatnot. So that was about eight years worth of work. Always I had an interest in uh, social justice and, uh, and being involved in, in community. Never really found my community in the city. I was constantly searching for my community, some community in the city. And I'm a Puerto Rican background as well as uh, Italian and Polish on my grandmother's side. So I just, it was tough, it was tough. And in the arts world, it can become very mercenary. So you're, you wanna do great work, but people have to eat, you know? So you have to be very um, attuned into the fact that, yeah, an artist might not choose to do this piece because will their agent like it or not? Will they come or not? Will they get a signed contract or not? So, you know, there, it became difficult uh, to feel that I could work in the arts and have this community and do this socially relevant work. So eventually I ended up on the East End of Long Island, uh, learned uh, about Ola actually when I was uh, lobbying our local politicians at the congressional level and the legislative level for money uh, because I wanted to do more with the arts uh, out here. So when I landed out in the East End, I immediately wanted to connect up with you know, what's happening at Guild Hall or what's happening at Bay Street or how do I do my own site specific work um, on some of these socially relevant topics as well. Uh, and then I just was hearing too much about the anti-immigrant sentiments that were coming out of the um, legislator, specifically out of, uh, well, whatever, it was bad. Um, and it led to violence and it led to horrible things, those words. So they, they were very important to stop. Um, got involved with Ola and Ola's mission is advocacy, education, and the arts. And even though I didn't, I didn't create that art piece of it, Ola always had a film festival that it did over the years. We've been around since 2002. Um, that was mainly the main piece of art and sometimes also an art show, which, which Ola did do an art show. Um, but I wanted to make sure that we could sort of crystallize the center point of the mission being those three, those three pillars and make sure that arts, for a while, I, I said arts first, arts, education and, and advocacy. Uh, but then, you know, other people came on, they were like, ah, and I was like, it's all equal. There's nothing that has any more weight. And they're like, we know Minerva, but we have to also be cognizant of other things. And I was like, all right. Um, so, you know, arts, uh, what we've been able to, to kind of weave in right now have been a variety of ways. So, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of work right now for an example, and I was gonna put, I'll put it to the chat as well, just to be able to see some of the things, but, um, we're doing some work around mental health, specifically youth, uh, teen youth access to mental health and emotional health support. Uh, so I started uh, bringing in uh, this young animator. She's from uh, actually from Chicago. She, her mother is Guatemalan. And, uh, and there's a survey that we've created that's the first ever regional survey to kind of link in and learn from youth themselves, their middle and high school experiences uh, with mental and emotional health struggles, um, how they coped with it. So from that survey, that's advocacy. And we are hitting that really hard, talking with Fred Thiel, our state assemblyman, talking at the state level, uh, trying to make sure that access points are understood, what, where the gaps are. But working with this animator, I pulled out uh, quotes that I was given permission to pull out um, from this an anonymous uh, survey and asked her to bring them to life. So we've got a series of three animated shorts that we'll be doing where I work with local teenagers to do the voiceover work. I work with this animator to bring this, this uh, story, this quote to life. And, uh, and that is probably the most impactful thing that's coming so far um, besides the behind the scenes work that I'm doing um, for either legislation or funding or whatever, or protocol shifts and policy shifts. But um, that's been some of the most poignant stuff coming out of, of that. Um, also uh, the work that we do in cinema, uh, with the film festival that we get this tremendous funding. And pretty much it's the main reason why our film festival happens is because of the Huntington Arts Council film festival funding that we get. Um, and we've been developing that film festival over the years so that uh, generally it's been usually three different days of the film festival. And in addition to that, sometimes we've flown in people from El Salvador, filmmakers from El Salvador to talk about their films. Um, that's been a lovely uh, uh, opportunity that we've had. And, um, and this is all Spanish language cinema with English subtitles. A couple of times we were able to bring in Portuguese cinema, but it's a little tougher because we wanna also make sure that Spanish speaking folks, so 
three, two subtitles in one film, it's difficult, but we try to balance it out. Uh, we've started something called the Ola Media Lab, and that's the last thing I'll say on this, but that is um, a dream that we had for a while, and we finally were able to do it a couple of years ago, where we have uh, filmmakers, or uh, right now a filmmaker, facilitating uh, go student uh, workshops going into actual schools on the East End. We work with 24 East End districts, not all at the same time, uh, but going into different school districts and having these six to eight, this particular one went a lot longer because of COVID, COVID kind of happened in the middle of it, but working with students to help sort of describe visual storytelling, uh, the different ways to do it, a little bit of the background, and then helping them through all those processes of editing, of shooting, of framing, of, of sound, of all those things. And then if those films are ones that we feel we could choose, um, we, we definitely highlight them during the Ola Film Festival. Um, and we did this past year as well. We got lucky to sneak into the Parish Art Museum, one of the venues we work with all the time, but the day before the governor's edict came down that we, uh, that we couldn't do that. So we were able to do it there, but then we had a film festival set up for the Sag Harbor Cinema, which was gonna be the first time that it was being used in a public sense, but the, that edict came down. We didn't feel safe to do it. We didn't want to do the wrong thing. So we, um, we just did that virtually only, but um, there's a little snippet. <laughs> that's, that's more than a little <laughs> snippet, but that's amazing. Um, that's amazing. And I think that, um, I think you really gave like, uh, you guys are really doing some very specific um, uh, programming that directly relates to equity in the BIPOC community, right? So I think those are fantastic examples of being very aware of how you develop programming and how you present it and what you choose to add and what you choose to leave out. So um, that's amazing. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and Mr. Zeta Pierce, we'd love to hear from you. Tell us, tell us all about you and your organization, please. Unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> First of all, let me say to Mark, you're going to see some historical emails because I could not get on the internet. <laughs> you made it. Calm down. I, yes, I saw them. <laughs> you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I got someone told me, well, get on the phone. How do I know about the phone? I'm 82. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, they got me on. Oh, okay. So I, I have quite a checkered career. Um, <laughs> this part of my life is the, is the icing on the cake. I started off uh, with a, I spent a lot of years at Verizon. I retired from there in 1990. I was a staff director. I was a com original computer. Most of you guys don't recall or never even heard of the little cards that we had to prepare to stick into this big machine when we wanted to program something. So I lived through that and I left Verizon. And at the time I started volunteering here at the museum. And then I decided to be a genealogist. So I got certified and my husband and I started this organization, the African Atlantic, African Atlantic Genealogical Society. Why African Atlantic? Because we can help anybody whose ancestors have come across the Atlantic or from Africa. <laughs> so that closed that up. So we, we, we were given space here at the museum to do that. We became the first museum in the United States to have its own genealogy department. Then um, after a, a, a little turnover of personnel and a lot of different things went on and 379 people were laid off by the county in 2012 and they asked us to manage the museum. And at that point, I was really, really happy because then we had something solid to work with. We were here in Hempstead. We knew what the social situation was. We knew what the economic situation was and we wanted to impact both. And I, I never even realized that I was thinking about using some form of art to have an impact. But what we did, we started working with the people who lived in the community. All the activists, we became friendly with them. They would share with us what they were doing and we would try to compensate. One of the things that came up during my time was that something like only 38% of the graduating seniors actually graduated from the Hempstead School District. That really got to me. And um, one of the guys that we knew from the community, a former uh, ex-felon, I should say, who had changed his way of life and was trying to help the kids. He was teaching chess. I said, can you teach it at the museum? So he was teaching our children 
from right across the street, Terrace Avenue has its own reputation. And uh, those kids were, they, they walk around with a little burden. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm wearing this mask because we have people working back and forth here and I don't wanna kill anybody. <laughs> no worries, we can hear you just fine. Okay, so um, we started giving them chess lessons and that was in April of last year. And they did well. And a group that had been studying chess for two years they were in a club, an after-school club, and they challenged our kids. Well, they held the tournament here. These kids across the street beat the heck out of those children. And I said, my goodness, just the coach. I said, how do they do that? He said, well, if you had to live in their environment, you'd be saying, if he moves this way, I'm gonna move that way. You gotta have eyes behind your head. Your safety, your survival is at stake. You're very keen on strategic thinking. And they just apply that same thing to the chessboard. That worked. Then we started thinking about how can we give these kids a little something to put in their toolkit besides their strategizing and stuff. But this new computer stuff, this, this new world and this tech world that we're talking about. Well, another person who has his own little organization, he started teaching our children how to um, use the uh, technology. They take a little doll and they put it on, a, it's on a motorcycle. They lay down these pieces of paper, like eight and a half by 11 sheets. They make lines going straight and then make a right angle and then straight the right angle and then they they take something a remote in their hand and they give instructions to that motorcycle telling it which way to go when you get to the corner you know when you go four feet forward and then make a sharp right angle turn and go uh so many feet and i saw a five-year-old doing this and i'm saying to myself this is crazy this is impossible and he said no I said, what in the world is she doing? He says, she's learning math, but she doesn't know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So since then, we've been trying to do the things that we think will enrich a person so they will think higher than they might if we didn't, you know, if we didn't have anything to do with that. And we found that art was the answer. Um, for instance, I'm in a room where we had an exhibit. There was a jail cell on one side, it was called Parallel Lives. And there was a slave quarters, like a, a rough burlap mess that the slave was supposed to be representing his place of sleep. And um, what we would teach these young kids when they would come in, you see, if you would think, we had heard that some of these, these gangs would, would infect their minds telling them, well, you know, you can be with us, we're big deals. You know, you go to jail, that's your first badge. And then when you come out, you know, you're hardened. And then, and it escalates to the point where you'd have to do something really bad to be a leader in this group. So we were trying to teach them that if you're thinking of anything that might have a consequence of going to jail, think about it twice because going to jail is exactly like going back to slavery. You have no control over your life. You don't know who can come to see you. You don't know who you can call. You don't know who you can write to. You don't know when, what you can eat, when you can eat. You sometimes work for free. So consider that. But the concept changed a bit. We opened last May, I think it was, and it ran for maybe a couple of months through August. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so weird. A couple of guys that, as I said, the, the community workers who are reformed, and one of them came in and said, I would like to use your jail cell to read a, something called Letters from the Jail. And I said, Letters from the Cell, rather. So I said, well, sure, you know, we, we, we're finished with our point. So he brought in people who would read either a letter that someone who was in prison sent to them or something that they had sent to a loved one who was in prison. And the remarkable thing about that was that uh, more than once, I would say at least four times, people who were unfamiliar with felons and things like that would say, you know what, I have a different idea about what it's like. She said, I always thought that when um, people were in prison, they were thinking about meeting others and maybe making deals and maybe we could work together on something. And, and she said, I thought they came out worse than they went in. She said, but these are people with real emotions. They're concerned about their family. They're telling their children, don't follow me. You be all you can be and all that kind of, and it was amazing. Now, our last project, <laughs> uh, I had read some, uh, Johns Hopkins did some sort of research and it was, they were talking about the, the generational changes in music. And um, 
how this new rapping thing, you know, some older people saying, I don't know what they're saying. They talk too fast and I don't know, it's, it's not music. And they explained that to the older mind, when you hear music, when anybody hears music, if it's unfamiliar, you'll open up a channel automatically to start thinking about it. And it changes, you learn something when you hear new music. If you were to hear a Scottish ditty, all of a sudden you say, mm, what was that? Mm, that's different music. You, the little channel opens up in your brain. So what we're doing with all of our exhibits, we're gonna have, we have a, a, a team that's gonna do an introduction, but using rap, using their little beats or whatever you call that stuff. <laughs> and they're gonna tell them like, well, this is the story of uh, Lewis Temple. He did such and such and such a thing. And they could either, if they're interested in that, well, they could move to the next exhibit and say, we'll see what this one is about. Maybe I'll spend some time over here. So oh, the entire museum has nothing but hidden history. I'm gonna turn this around and see if you can see our little jail because I'm sitting right opposite it. Can you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a jail cell. We had it built especially for us. <laughs> oh, I'm back again. Why am I looking at myself? Did I hit something wrong? <laughs> no, we, we, we see, see you. you. You're good. You're well, good. You're I, good. I see me too. <laughs> but I, well, I, I think that's, but, um, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that, that, that that's the kind of thing we want to do now. We want to keep bringing up hidden history. And we also want to encourage these children because many of our exhibits are, for, are about individuals who are not in our history, but who are African-Americans. Say for instance, like Rosa Parks, everybody knows what Rosa Parks did in Alabama. I mean, you could probably go to Iraq and find somebody who has heard of Rosa Parks. But you ask a New Yorker who desegregated public transportation in New York City, they don't know. Her name was Elizabeth Jennings. She's a very wealthy black woman. And some people think that's why she was never acknowledged in a history book anywhere because Rosa represented what everybody, some people would like to think all black people were like, she had a nice easy, she was a, a seamstress. She was a young married woman. She took the bus to work every day. Uh, so she was kind of ordinary, but this woman was wealthy beyond all measure. Her father had and he had invented dry cleaning in 1821 and patented it and nobody could make it or use it but you know except through him so he became very wealthy you know and and he, he also did a lot of other things with his with his money and thing but what i'm saying is i'm we, we are giving exhibits that encourage our youth to get a better, better understanding of who they were they have a life uh, ancestral life that is much greater than slavery it, it's about resilience it's about studying it's about having a, a, a goal in mind. We have a whole thing on Long Island musicians, all the very famous uh, musicians who at one time or other lived on Long Island, or from Massapequa to Glen Cove to Freeport. I mean, and, and that, that whole exhibit is, extends about a, a, maybe about uh, 20 feet long uh, in here. And um, so it, it, it's a, it's a, you gotta use everything you possibly can to, make, to get people prepared for equity. Now, justice is going to take a harder time. It's going to take a whole lot of more work with justice. But with equity, you, you, you have to build yourself up and find your place. And you got to have goals. And, and sometimes our children have not heard of anybody who did well, anybody who came up with something fantastic or whatever that they can be proud of. Sometimes they never hear it. It's right. not like history book. Not enough. Right, and choosing and and choosing to tell those stories so that they they will know yes. that right and yes. to yes. and you made a really good point you have to you have to do the work before you have to do work before you even begin to uh, decide how you are going to build equity right absolutely so absolutely that's amazing absolutely. that's amazing those programs are incredible and I love the fact that um and so many of you have connections right because art connects everything it connects. Mm -hmm core subjects, it connects social, it connects um, everything, science, math, uh, you know, relationships. So it can be used to teach and to talk about all of those things. And that's something that uh, many times um, administrators and um, lawmakers don't, um, don't understand. And it's hard for them to see that connection. So I think it uh, behooves us as artists and, and administrators and teaching artists to really always um, make that um, a point of uh, explaining that to people and showing how those connections work. 
Now you guys have um, basically answered our next question. So I do want to ask you if something. I could just uh, say one thing in here. Uh, when I was formulating this in my brain and trying to come up with something, Joycetta was the first person I called and we had mm -hmm. a conversation. I think it was at the end of June last year. Yeah. You know, to put this together. And, you know, let's, I mean, I'm a white man of a certain age and I want to talk about you know, equity and social justice. And, uh, you know, Joyce Seta was the first person, you know, I knew I could go to and, and ask her to help me through this. And the first thing she said is, yes, you should do this. And yes, I'm in. So <laughs> thank you for helping me put this together. And we go back, you know, all of the panelists all today, way have mm -hmm. been doing this, but Joyce said, I think is the one I've known for over 20 some years. Absolutely. Um, and you know, what was nice about this is that I didn't have to go doing research. Well, who on Long Island is doing these things? I knew immediately who was doing it. Um, you know, uh, her story, Ola, um, the African American Museum. And I know Napoleon and Patty have mm -hmm. done, uh, you know, arts education, et cetera. This was just, off the top of my head. So I think that's a great thing. Uh, some mm -hmm. of it has to do with um, direct NISCA funding. Some of it has to do with funding through the program that we administer for NISCA. And, you know, there is a wealth, a wealth on Long Island and we have to like keep shining lights on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, um, I do wanna, I do wanna touch on something that was mentioned specifically by Minerva and also um, I believe by Joy Zeta. And that's advocacy, right? Mm. Because I think that's really the next step. We do all these things in our communities. We do all these things with arts organizations and, and as individuals and everything. But what we really need to do is change how legislators, right? Mm. Fund and, and what they do. So um, for those of you that have worked directly uh, in arts advocacy, what are some challenges? Well, I think actually, to me, the biggest challenge would be how to start. Where do I start? If I want to get involved in that, where do I start? How do I um, contact, connect with people? Yes, Minerva. <laughs> Microphone. Hi there, hi there. Um, so I, I, uh, I, I want to look at a piece of advocacy that I think is important that you know we've been involved in out here and we're not solely responsible for you know some of the good things but we're certainly helping um, but there are organizations out here on the east end of Long Island that have that get tr great funding they always need funding of course but like the guild halls the parish museum mm -hmm. you know those spaces they're major spaces and they're all also major um uh, destination points in our communities, but oftentimes not, um, is everything okay? I'm seeing the arts, the Huntington arts, is everyone there? Yeah, okay, good. Um, that oftentimes they're not as accessible or they're, it could be the optics of it, or it could be that there are unintended barriers or long lasting barriers that never have been, uh, you know, demolished. Um, and so Ola's advocacy in that regard has been to sometimes very quietly, but persistently work with those administrators, those boards, and be involved in what they're doing in terms of diversity and inclusion. And not, not just for the occasional showing or the occasional, like, you know, because for a while there you get, hey, can you help me translate this? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so what we're constantly doing is kind of using that as, as a learning opportunity to say, okay, then who do you have on your board? If you mm -hmm. don't have anyone on your board to speak to your community, quite literally, that's, that's a problem and you need to work to fix that problem. And it's not an easy solve, but you need to make that one of your goals uh, and then and make it a serious goal. Like it's number one or two or three and that's it. But so what we're seeing is that working with some of these very large, uh, pretty moneyed organizations on how we can help them to shift um, how they view not only their audience base in terms of how many, and I'm, I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna be quite frank, how many black and brown people I can bring through the doors so I can get better grants um, mm -hmm. But so that they can actually have people that are on the board that can actually make sure that they're, they're looking at what artists are they bringing in uh, to be to be on the walls um, and 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 sort of a, a long uh, the long view of how this evolves the long view of what this museum means to this community when we've got 40 to 50 percent Latino student body across our entire East End our school districts are 40 to 50 percent Latino student body um, and you and you look at some of these institutions. And you see what's going on historically there. You know there are problems there. So you by advocating directly with them, 
they've got they got to make sure that they're kind of doing the right thing and some of them do some of them take a lot longer but right now i think guild hall is going to have almost everything in in spanish and in english uh, their programming has shifted drastically again not to do only with ola also to do with a great new executive director who's been there a couple of years andrea <clears throat> who's amazing um but those kinds of shifts are important because if i I can definitely advocate uh, at, at the local levels, at the legislative levels. It's kind of hard. Ola does get some money from um, the omnibus funding, you know, for for uh, for tourism and 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 whatnot. Um, but it's tough. I mean, sometimes filling out that paperwork and doing the back mm -hmm. back backing all that up can be mm -hmm. so exhausting that you say, okay, I've got five thousand dollars from the county. How much blood did I shed to get? <laughs> and when you're a small right, organization, and, and, right. we we don't only do arts. You know, we do advocacy, education, and the arts, and they're all very important. But I don't want to give up the arts. But when I look at some of the grants, I'm like, I can't possibly shed any more blood for that one. Um, so me getting to work with Guild Hall or Parish Museum or Southampton mm -hmm. Arts Center or Southampton Cultural Center or any of the other arts organizations, and then be able to help. You know, it's not even always Ola's art. It's not even always Latino stuff that I'm trying to bring in there. It's any other kind of work that brings in other people from our community that don't typically walk through those doors. So that advocacy, you know, it, it benefits Ola because it benefits our community. And that's how I see it. We might not get any money. We, we don't get any kind of shared gain necessarily or money in that situation. But I believe that it's our role to help advocate at that level. So I think that's another piece of advocacy that I just wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Minerva, we, we also have an arts uh, consortium of arts councils um, that we work with NISCA with also that same thing. It helps us to unite our voices to bring more to the table for NISCA and NIFA for them to, to then speak with us. So that's really been helpful, I think. And I, I Mark. one thing that's very curious on Long Island that is not like the rest of the state, and it took me a while as an executive director to realize this, um, you go to other counties or other areas of the state, there's like one arts council, one school district. You come to Long Island and it's so territorial. What do we have, 126 school districts, for goodness sakes. Uh. Um, there's about nine arts councils that have been talking to each other regularly, but that's unheard of. That is unheard of. There's usually one arts council that does that. And, and you know, that is something, you know, the more we can interconnect with each other, I think the better it is. And the more we can put our voices together, the further along we will get. But Milady and or Napoleon, what what if, what do you think about the uh, challenges of advocacy and, and have you done anything? What have you done to, you know, in that realm to kind of start bringing in, um, you know, more partnerships or things like that? Hello. <laughs> okay, so Napoleon took his mute out. So um, we have, I mean, it's it, like Minerva says, it's just been, it, it's just so hard, like to just get $5,000 from, from somewhere for these partnerships. But uh, we have been uh, really working with the universities and the colleges and the high schools to, to be able to get the grants. Like for example, uh, we have partnership with Stony Brook and uh, we have programs where we take the high school students uh, writing with the college students from Stony Brook to write stories and create powerful stories. And mm. then they can help the, the, the students into doing a college essay. So um, that partnership with Stony Brook has been amazing, but yet, you know, it's not, it, it's not something that's providing finances for us, but it, it's good because it helps the community. Like Minerva says, you know, we do things to, to help with the community. We also have been uh, with um, Hempstead High School, Westbury High School, many, many high schools. Now we have gotten um, grants from them uh, that before we used to have like after school programs. Now we've become part of the school. So we mm. the schools as part of the curriculum 
but it's a lot of work. It's like, oh my God, we're still waiting for like the contrast to come in. And so in that way, and of course, like, you know, with, with the communities also, I, I mean, I've heard of Minerva, I'm, I'm kind of still new and still learning, but um, we have partnership with um, Head Start which is the new partnership. And also out in the East End, Rural Migrant um, with, the, with the farm workers there, which is, and we do workshops with them. Um, basically those are like our partnerships. And of course we have the board and we have the Hafsha University and LIU. So uh, we're very much with the universities and I think that that really helps. Yeah, it's and now it's even it's even harder because of COVID, right? So yeah. everything yeah. is taking longer and it's upended and there's so much uncertainty and especially in the schools that schools are afraid to kind of make a commitment, I think, because yeah. they don't know what's going to happen. So it makes it even harder. Uh Joyzetta, Napoleon, any thoughts? Well mine mine is real simple. Um we we don't have the staff to do that. And 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 when I basically start getting involved with the grants and stuff. It is very, as everybody knows, it's very time consuming. Um, even with the advent of COVID, um, on, on the other side, we apply for PPP, idle, all that kind of stuff, like just to stay afloat. And we wanna basically, I personally wind up working a lot through other organizations, city. I found what's, for me, it was easier to work in city-based organizations than uh, Nassau, uh, Long Island-based uh, organizations. And I don't know whether it was just the the interaction with me and the community, but I felt that I, I knew a long time ago that as an organization, we, not, we might not flourish on Long Island. Ver long Island was very clandish. It was driven by PTAs. There was really no community, like really community organizations. We're in the city of New York, just as an example, I saw all these schools, how can you not work? There's a school over there, there's a school over there. A school. And I didn't have to go through PTAs. I could go right to the principal and hey, you know, I, was, I, was, I, was, I didn't know what it was called at that time. It's called Guerrilla Market. So we could go right, I could go right to the person. I didn't have to go to the PTA to get to the, and I didn't go through all the rigmarole. So what happened with us, I found out it was easy for us to work in the city because it's just so, it's the con, con, congestion that is there. It opened up a little bit on Long Island because of the disparity. And yeah, you know, we got calls because you, you maybe look like something that we can use you to get in. That's what it was about. So to me, it was very false. You wanted me to get into the school so that you could get into the schools and therefore look like you were diversified. So that's one of the main problems I found. Don't use um, this diversity as a, as a means to get into something. Then you exclude the people that you got in because now I'm in, I don't need you anymore. So mm -hmm. what we did was we were wise enough to go into the city schools. There was a lot of diversity there anyway. And I didn't have to sort of pigeonhole and, 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 and let someone use that organization just so that they could get in and then you were excluded since we're not a big organization. So I think the best thing that I found was to communicate a lot with those organizations that were outreaching that could help you uh, uh, try and get in and try and do the best you can. And, the, and, the, and I think one of the main marches that I hear and I do myself too, was not so much about making the money to survive as an organization and as a person, but how could I contribute to the community? My first thought, I wanted to work with people that wanted that, that I call baby, uh, the benefit the babies, I call them, the benefit the children, and the work will come. You'll get work. So when we concentrated in Hempstead, it was because the density, I could concentrate and we can work. So, but going back to the funding, that was always a challenge. BOCES wasn't really giving out any money. I mean, you had to work through BOCES to go to the school again. So we found out, we went to NISCA, Huntington Arts Council, Freeport Arts, Arts Council at that point, and then when we got our vendor code and in the city of New York, that's when things really opened up because then I could get beyond with as an organ, we get a lot more money, we could get a lot more done. And I wasn't just there to, uh, to show and tell. We could do residencies and workshops and to be part of the community. We're in Long Island, as Mark knows, that just started to happen now. We're not again, right. now, now they want you to come in and, right. and not show and tell. They want you I to really, come in I really know, right. I'm glad you said that because I really noticed that being, being someone who worked in a lot of public schools as an artist in residence for weeks or months, they had nothing like that in Long Island. And mm. I was shocked. I was like, what? How could you not have this? This is like the best thing ever. So, and I have noticed, yes, that now it's sort of starting to happen a little more, but I think that, I think that as, as teaching artists, as artists and as organizations, we have to sort of advocate for more of that because it can only benefit the teachers, the administrators and the students. Joyzetta, as, um, as the director of a museum and an mm -hmm. organization and a 
we're all businesses really, but um, as the director of a museum, how do you see what are your challenges in advocacy and um, you know, reaching out and trying to you know, advocate for the museum and for your programming? Well, actually we are in a, in a, in a pretty good con uh, situation because it's a, it's the, Nassau, the museum belongs to Nassau County. We just manage it in, on behalf of the county. And so we don't have an overhead. We don't have rent, we don't have electricity, we don't have any bills at all. And because we are the only African American museum between here and Philadelphia, everybody who has a question for an African American museum calls us. We have a, a range of the local schools, Hofstra, Adelphi, um, uh, Suffolk County, Nassau, Nass uh, Nass uh, Suffolk Community College and Nassau Community College. They all, if the students are taking art or Afro studies, um, for the community colleges, their final exam is their visit to the museum, selecting a topic and you know, writing something about that issue. Um, everyone gets credit toward their grade. Or the colleges, even, um, mer um, what's the one in uh, the, the religious school in, not Mercy. Malloy. Uh, Malloy. Malloy, right. I get Mercy the hospital and Malloy the college mixed up. <laughs> well, their students get credit toward their grade if they prepare a paper and submit it about what they found out at the museum. Um, and then too, when people look for partnerships, um, we get many, many partnerships where people approach us and you know, we have to write a, a support letter. And sometimes they get a grant, sometimes they don't. But, but it's, it's not, it's, we're not hard pressed to, to, to be able to do the things that we do. Uh, because we spend a lot of time, we don't have artifacts per se. There are not many. We have a room full of like masks and spears and old musical instruments and things like that. But most of our exhibits are panels where we explain about some historic person and what they did. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and we have our own print printer here. We can print these three feet by six feet panels. We send them out for framing. That's the only thing we don't do, but we, we, we can manage pretty well. And then the county supports us with, uh, uh, with programs and things sometimes when they can, you know, but um, it, it, it hasn't been very, I mean, people contact, most, contact us most of the time. We even have students who are studying to be museum curators or directors, and all they want to do is come in and sit down and have a conversation with either the curator or myself. So it, it's, the door is swinging open pretty often. And a lot of times, it, like, like in the case of the students, we don't charge them anything for, for something like that. And, and we, we feel we're, we're making a contribution. And since I went through the whole museum studies thing at Northwestern uh, uh, College, I, university rather, uh, I can give them the straight skinny on what's on the inside, not just, because sometimes you experience things that are not in the books, <laughs> but some, sometimes you need to hear something from the books as well. But uh, we, we haven't had too much of a problem with that. That's fantastic. And, and as it should be, I wish for all of us. Um, but um, so I think, um, I think it, it almost seems like, I don't know, tell me if I'm wrong, but it almost seems like arts organizations and artists need specific advocacy groups out mm -hmm. here. They mm -hmm. need groups that just work to help them, you know, um, advocate for programming and for, you know, a place at the table, right? Um, so that we're not, like you said, you know, working our fingers to the bone, <laughs> like how much mm -hmm. blood can I give to do all of this, right? Mm -hmm. We need that help. So maybe that's something that we can work towards too. I think that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm gonna switch it up a little bit. Um, um, teaching artists and artists also, you know, want a seat at the table at arts organizations, obviously. And how can the artist community and arts organizations work together to offer programs that uplift individuals in the community with in their individual perspectives and experiences that they bring? Um, I know we have, there's, you know, arts organizations have a lot of programs for artists for exhibiting and things like that. Some organizations like Huntington Arts Council has teaching artists that go into the schools and work, you know, with the schools. But how can artists, individual artists who want to be a part of what arts administrators do, how can they work with you or how can they get involved with you to do that? 
Minerva. Hi there. Um, I love the way you raise your hand. <laughs> um, That's the classroom. <laughs> classroom, yeah, I can't help it. Um, I, I did want to start off just by saying to Milady that uh, that we are we are fortunate enough, I'm fortunate enough to have known Erica Duncan a long time uh, from her story, the, uh, I think, the, what, the founder, maybe? Uh, yeah, or the second, founder. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, when I, I before I joined Ola, I was the exec. I was the I'm sorry, the shelter director uh, for the retreat, the only domestic violence uh, shelter out yeah. here in the East End. And back in I think 2012 or so, um, I worked to bring uh, Erica and her story into the shelter, uh, knowing how important that um, that uh, that whole model was of of, um, of of really telling your story and writing that down and sharing that and. Uh, that that model was so important. So anyway, um, and I do, you know, I talk with Erica whenever I can. We'd love to do more, um, and we will do more. But but thank you, Milady. I just want to make sure that you that you knew we were very very much in touch and, and all that. I know Erica always speaks of you, and as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. when I mentioned that I was coming to this forum, she was like, oh, you know, just had a Minerva, and she was just telling that that was one of the best experience she's ever had, one of the best, most beautiful, cleanest shelter um that she's ever been to oh that's wonderful yeah. to hear I, I look forward to working with you milady as well so mm -hmm. i hope now that we get to meet each other a bit more um that we get to do that um i think i think i think artists if if they could feel comfortable is maybe sometimes it feels like you're only supposed to reach out i mean as an artist or as an actor i guess you know some work that i get to do every once in a while as an actor in a theater or film is to reach out to some of those um, nonprofits that are around you, um, whether they be art organizations or a mix of art and advocacy organizations, and um, present your ideas to them. I mean, I feel I feel like it's tough, and I know a lot of artists do that, but um, and I think organizations should do maybe even a better job about either putting out a call and saying that we want to have a dialogue with you. We want to hear about some of the maybe site-specific work you want to do if you're an organization that has bricks and mortar. Ola doesn't really have that. We've got an office in, in East Hampton, uh, but we work across the East End. But um, but if, you, if you've got an organization that has bricks and mortar uh, for art to get to get that open call out, what what can that dynamic bring? And whether that's not even what you normally do, you know, that could be a whole other focus. It could be that you want to bring people in to do Scottish ditties or, or whatever it might be. But like let let there be more of that 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 dialogue driven stuff where it's sort of the magic happens. And then you don't know, you don't know what comes from that. But I think artists should be m encouraged more to reach out to cer certain organizations that you might not think, but maybe they've got some funding for that. Maybe they've got a whole audience there that's waiting to see exactly that artist do their work or share their work. Um, I think that there's all like, like you said, Mark, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of silos that go on out here. And I think uh, we need to, you know, really start breaking through those, those glass walls or whatever they are and, and just assume that our, our community is here for all of us. And, uh, and then just, there, there are no lines. There are no lines. I cross over that line. I call you, I say, hey, you, you're a food organization. What can we do together? You know, I'm an artist, I, I do this, what can we do? Like, let's just cross all those lines and encourage, encourage ourselves and, you know, and other folks to cross those lines as well. First step. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but Mark, um, Ch Channel 12 News is here and they're supposed to be filming the museum. I tell you, they chase us down because we're the only one in town. But <laughs> advocate for us, advocate for us all. I got a lot of stories to give them. <laughs> Thank That's you, Joy Zetta. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. It was nice meeting you. Nice meeting you as well. All right. Um, I, I'm just going to jump in and, and what you were talking about, Minerva. Um, Milady, I know there are certain, you know, there's some people who are who are on this panel. Um, you have talk a little bit about your prison program. Yes, because I know it, it, it's the type thing. If I weren't holding all my programming together with chewing gum right now, I would love to do something like that. We have a lot of visual artists and performing artists who uh, teaching artists who would be part of this if we could figure out a way to make it bigger. So talk a little about what you do with your prison program. Great. So with the prison program, unfortunately, because of COVID, we have not been able to get into the prisons. It's something that is right now on hold. But in the past, we have done 
so much with the prison, with the women, with the women incarcerated. Um, we have also published a few, the stories they get published, a lot of them get uh, put on Long Island Winds with like with the immigration stories. Uh, we have like these, uh, for example, this book right here was written by all the women in prison. It's called Voices. And uh, we also have the All I Ever Wanted, which is the children of the incarcerated. Mm. My God, these stories will break your heart. You know, those kids waiting and, you know, what happens when their parents go to jail and when, when they're home and what they go through with their, with their mom. And then this was one of um, this, this book became um, actually not Voices was the book that became mandatory in the jail for the those um, correction officers that were graduating, they had to read it in order to be able to graduate so they can understand the stigma between prejudice and you know what what goes on in jails. Um, we did we do uh, workshops with the men um, in Riverhead and also in Yampak. Uh, so it, it has just helped them so much. A lot of them have come out and they have become ad advocacy for um, her story. Um, they do, when we do the Freedom Forum, they have done their readings there. And, um, you know, like right now, unfortunately, I don't know what's going to happen, but I really, really do hope that we can get this program back on. Um, you know, and, and be able to, you know, it, it's sad because it's, uh, it was a big loss. Mm -hmm. I feel that um, we had a facilitator, uh, John Dios. He was the a father of a, of a child that, was, uh, that had an addiction. And what he went through, it was just horrendous. So he was facilitating the workshops in, in the jail and when he told his story, one of the boy was saying, well, oh my God, now I understand my father. So it kind of brings that understanding between father and children and it, may, and it gives you that reflection. We have been able to, to help some of them like go, because of their stories, they have, their, their, um, they have been able to get less of uh, like a verdict and mm -hmm. it's just an incredible uh, work that that's being done there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I was going to say, just if we can figure out how to do it, I mean, Napoleon, it, you're, you're, you're pre, what you do would work very well with a program like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Eddie, same thing, you know, what you do could work very well in these settings and I think be um, help increase, this is how you're going to increase social equity, you know. Um, by, by going to these underserved populations and giving different alternatives, you know, the arts and using the arts a, a, as a way to make change. True. And also, this is a quick reminder. I, I think the fact that you're talking about the artists and the arts administrators, the more meetings like this uh, that reach out from the art, when the arts organizations reach out to the artists and vice versa to let them know that because of the COVID, you know, a lot of people are reaching out anyway because there's nowhere to go. So I think it's a good learning period for everyone. And I think any, anytime I, I go out, it's also, I'm always on the lookout for things that there's just conferences uh, in, in New York City that the Arts and Education Roundtable. So therefore we get all kind of advocacy all, all over from teaching artists to artists administrators, what grants are coming down to the pike. So all of those things that I found for us that was more important to be in the city because they offered that with Long Island didn't really offer those diversity, but now that Mark's here, now we know it's gonna happen. So we'll have that advocacy so that everybody gets to know what's going on in the arts world and everyone hopefully from the administrator to the to the artist will have that interconnection one and find out I'm, I'm sitting here taking notes because some of the things that I did in the past, now I got to go back to that. And I mind you for the incarceration program. Uh, I'd like to talk to you more about it because when we tried to go for the incarceration program, there was no funding. So it's like, well, you, I, you know, then you had to go through all this thing to get in and I, yeah, it's like, wow. Then, That's you know, all, the thing, it's it, the yeah. funding. Yeah. I mean, we do so much for free. Like basically we were just not because we care so much about the program, we were going there and getting no funding right, whatsoever. Right. And 
I, I mean, you can't do it for free all the time, you know, right, right, <laughs> but right. because it is so based on empathy and compassion. And that's what we're trying to get. Basically, that that is our goal. You know, that we what we do is when we put these people uh, to write. Right. Um, we use the what we call the stranger reader. So is that person that knows nothing about you that you want to lure, to bring, to change the hearts, the minds and policies of legislators or anyone who, 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 who gets to read your story. So this is like the notion of data care. So I'm gonna dare you to care, which is basically our cornerstone. Mm -hmm. So if we pick, let's say you, when we start the writing, we have what we call the page one moment where where would you like that stranger reader to meet you? We would meet you when you're a young child or when you're a teenager, or maybe now where you are. And what is the story that you wanna tell? If your words have the power to change hearts, minds and policy, what would you say? And normally, I mean, just imagine, uh, uh, I always think of one woman that uh, was in, in the jail. She was a single mom and of course addiction. And I mean, she's so, they're so marginalized because why would you give, the thing is like, why, do you, why would you give up your child for drugs? You know, and people don't understand them. I mean, it's not like we're not trying to people to understand, but to see, I mean, there's, a, there's something else there that's going, that is affecting her. So just trying for us to understand the people in jail also so that that empathy and compassion that comes along with it and, and we also and we also know that that um like you said we there's only certain things we can do for free right yeah. as a as an artist myself and as an, a teaching artist i started doing i work with a group a grassroots group called sea of visibility and we're all volunteers we're just starting and um we are uh focusing on mental health and through the arts and I started making these little videos, free videos from Art Out of Anything, which is my program, and um, putting them up on all of my social media and at Sea of Visibility. And I did that through the entire spring and summer. Um, and then I would do like one minute art is, just to show that art is math, art is science, art is this, art is that. Yeah, I wasn't getting paid for it, but it did a couple of things. It A, it, it built a little equity for people to be able to see something for free. So parents who were home with their kids could look at, oh, here's a free video. I can learn how to do this. So we could do this really quick. Oh, look, we don't have acrylic paint, but we have, you know, beets. Well, you can make paint out of beets, you know, and things like that. So, so it was stuff that you could use at home and you didn't have to go out and spend any money. It was leftovers that you could use to make things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and all of that now, you know, it is still a business, right? So eventually I am gonna need funding, but now I have, I provided people with this, um, this opportunity, but I also have this whole bulk of work for myself that when I can begin applying and everything, I will have my, you know, my whole, my videos and everything that I've already created um, done. Yeah. So, you know, it was, it was kind of like trying to make the best of a, of a tough situation. You know, so I think that, and I think a lot of artists, you know, I know a lot of artists who've been doing that this whole time. We've just been doing things for free because um, we just want to do it. You know, we have to do it. So I think that, um, I think it's a wonderful idea, like you said, being a little bit more proactive as artists mm -hmm. and being willing and hopefully being able to say, look, I want to do this for free. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't, it's okay. Or even barter, you know, something maybe, you know, at some point, or, you know, you can, find a way to barter time or resources or something so that both of you are getting um, something out of it, but you're giving as well. So um, I think we have so to start rewarding with, too, you know. Yeah, more creative ways of figuring it out, you know. So um, I'm going to throw something out here and this is, you never know who's listening, but you know, in their, their strength in numbers, I would be, if several of us want to get together when we can and go to probably a, a federal legislator, you know, a, a senator or a congressperson and say, hey, you know, Huntington Arts Council would be happy to administer a program through Department of Justice using the arts 
uh, for social equity, to do prison programs. Um, if we could pool together and get that, and then there would be some funding to, to use for these sorts of programs. I'm in, let's talk to each other and, and try to make this happen. Cause you know, it's, uh, you never know who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody that's been looking for this pet project to happen anyway. So keep that in mind. And yes, we do need to keep talking to each other about these things. Yes, absolutely. Um, and if anyone, uh, people have been adding to the chat. So I just wanna say, please keep doing that. Information, questions, et cetera. And this is being recorded. And I'm assuming that Huntington Arts will be able to give you a link to the recording so that you guys can see it later and refresh your memory about what we spoke about. You, you have to give us a, 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 a week or so to put this together. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this is, well, who's going to do this? My, 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 my business manager, my development person, the executive director, you know, it's not, oh, I will just, I'll, my, uh, I'll do it for you, Mark. I'll yeah, do it for you for free. Okay. <laughs> so, there's some, it will um, be up and it will be available. Stay tuned on that. And I see my, my communication person is smiling, you know, <laughs> um, but we will get this out and, you know, she could probably do it, except she's putting a newspaper to bed right now, <laughs> which is going to print this weekend. Welcome to the world of the arts. <laughs> a lot of like Minerva talked about that, you know, the sweat equity you put in things. Where's the point where is this worth it? You know, what can we do with our delicate balance? It'll get done. We'll get there. Yeah. So I have, I have another question. Um, <laughs> if we, uh, defining social justice as the equitable, di equitable distribution of resources, how can learning through the arts center the creative process to build equity and encourage social justice practices. So how can we encourage uh, social justice practices through the arts? Mm -hmm. How can we do that? Yes, Milady. <laughs> well, uh, like with us, I know that um, when we did the, uh, the book Voices and many of those stories were heard through legislators, activists and published, um, we were able to help with the race of age movement back then. So um, I feel that many of these stories or what we do would can definitely help with with um, you know with the movement. Um, thinking also with Minerva, um, the women that have been like victims of domestic violence. Um, I'm sure that through like their stories, maybe if they have a verdict, that could have been maybe being softer on the verdict because of what they heard, because of their personal stories. Um, the, the programs, let's say the school programs, I can, a lot of the teachers that, that have given testimonies, they are, stating that the children that are able to express themselves, that are able to raise their voices, that are able to, to really be themselves and, and, and show what, who they are, have done so much better, especially like in the Hempstead High School where we have all these in-school programs and I help them with their SATs and to, um, and their ex, ex excelling in many, many, many of their courses because they were, they were able to express themselves and raise their voices. Those were like some of the things that I know that, that with their stories, they, they have been able to help. Um, the social workers find that the kids are now more open with their feelings and, and they're, they're going to them and, and just, providing them with feeling safer in school and, and being more open about. So, um, yeah, so I, just some of the things that I've noticed that has has happened and a lot of them ha have been able to pass their SATs, you know, and that's all part of the arts, part of the stories that, that they're bringing into the schools. By helping them to do that, you're, yes. you're building equity, you're giving them, you know, that what they need to to become, you know, to have the same, hopefully some of the same uh, privileges that other people have too, right? That'll come easier to other people. 
And way. then, you know, it, it, it makes them uh, more confident in themselves. And so many of our students have gone into doing bigger and better things. Like I know one of our DACA students who went to Hempstead High School, she is now a public relations person. She graduated from Hofstra and she was an undocumented student. Uh, we have um, one of our facilitators who worked, she came, but she was she worked in a, in a factory for seven years, then decided to go back to school. And now she's one of the facilitators. She's graduating from Stony Brook. Brooke, she did her master's and now she's going for a PhD. So, mm -hmm. you know, I know that through these stories, it, it, it's helping them very a lot. And, and do you guys ever bring like people who have, have participated in your programming to come back? and do something for your organization? Yes. Um, um, so we have, for example, the, Belinda, she, we, she went through our training. So she's working with us. So she's uh, helping with the stories, telling. We, we have a workshop with the Rural Migraine and Head Start, which she, uh, we actually facilitate, she and I. And she's being part of, part of her story. Then we also have, which is um, the, the student writers. We bring them to um, to different places to speak about their experiences. And right now we're working on a study guide. And I thought of um, Napoleon mm -hmm. when you say that you work on study guides, was working on a study guide for, for the high school students to use uh, and teachers and educators to use with the, with the high school students. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, how about Napoleon and Minerva? Do you ever use anyone else that's been in your program to... Um to come back and give back or, or anything like that. Because that's another way also, you know, to provide internships for, you know, students or people who've been part of your programs um, because then they could lead them on the path to something totally different than they thought that they would actually be able to do, right? I'll, I'll say that we, um, not that we're able to do it all the time, but uh, quite honestly, I really am, uh, enjoy getting to employ people uh, and getting to whether it's able to find funding for a particular position, whether it's a long-term position or, or a temporary position or a paid internship. Um, this past summer, because of COVID and because of having a lot more um, first-year college students still in the area, and even though, of course, a lot of what we're doing is, is virtual, they could be doing it from whatever campus, but because they're back here and wanting to connect to their community out here, uh, finding that, you know, a lot more access and, uh, and building in, you know, some paid internships, again, where we can, we don't have loads of money either, but um, when it came to some of the, the, the newer initiatives that we're doing with the youth focus and mental and emotional health, there were just obvious ways that we could kind of link up um, and then working with uh, also local filmmakers, filmmaker, African-American local filmmaker who's 21, I believe, from the area, working with another student to do live action shorts, uh, talking about mental and emotional health uh, topics, very short, you know, maybe, maybe two minute uh, short videos. Uh, and that, you know, one gentleman who was from out here, Mexican-American who um, went to Georgetown University and kind of did a short, very, very brave short on, um, the uh, imposter syndrome, you know, what it felt like to be at Georgetown as a Mexican American student and feel like he, like it was a big mistake that Georgetown had made a massive mistake and they just didn't know it yet. Of course, uh, something that maybe we've all felt at one point or another. Um, but having the, that student, you know, be involved in some of the workings that we do, whether that be Latino teen empowerment workshops that we do in the schools, uh, which we do, which we haven't done as many of them virtually, but we can, you know, but the problem that I'm having is that I feel like I don't wanna put that on the shoulders of students when they already are burdened by this virtual learning that it's hard to make that super exciting. Even with the arts, it's still, it's hard for me because I just feel so bad that they have to do that every day. Um, and how do we connect people up now? But, you know, bringing students back in to work with us, um, the work that we're doing with the Ola Media Lab is, is important work because what we're trying to do is encourage that art form to be whatever it is they want it to be. And str strangely enough, when they had the option to do whatever they wanted recently in Riverhead uh, High School, and we try to do a little bit more work with them these days is um, they chose to do their immigration story. Not something that we asked at all. We, you know, anything that they were gonna bring to bear, this was the ENL uh, students at Riverhead. Um, anything that they brought to bear, if it was a, a story about a flower, as far as I'm concerned, that's social justice, that 
that student you know, has very little voice uh, in the community, sometimes often even in a home where they have to focus a lot on survival, especially during COVID. So getting to do, um, you know, getting to express themselves that way, but they all chose eventually that they wanted to do their own immigration stories. Um, and so, and beyond that, they want to do an art exhibition where they can really just have, you know, uh, a performance space or, um, you know, an exhibition space <clears throat> where that's what they're, that they're, they're showing, not just that story, but where they have all of their voices there. So we're, we're kind of letting them guide the way on what future programming might look like as well. Um, and just trying it out. It doesn't mean that, you know, that's something that we can sustain. It might mean that we try it once and we work with some folks and maybe it develops from there, but really like letting those um, sort of youth leadership help, help us guide some programming that we want to do and have them be leading it. You know, a lot of what Ola is doing is also bringing youth into <clears throat> any critical form that we're in, whether it's, um, you know, police reform, which we're involved in right now, making sure that youth, fighting for youth to have a table, a seat at the table, um, whatever it might be. So youth that we're working with in an artistic sense, we might also be bringing into other conversations because if you can express yourself creatively or artistically, and you can kind of stand on your feet in that arena, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes you're a person that could stand on your feet and a lot of other arenas as well. And uh, so we kind of recognize that. Yeah, it's, it's building skills and you don't think that you would get them from that. I, I realized after I was the um, VP and chair of programming for Westbury Arts for five years and um, my entire experience I knew came from being the president of the Homeschool Association for 15 years for my kids. It, everything came from that because and that's where I learned all those skills. I never realized it, but that's exactly where they came from. So this is giving them that opportunity to find those skills that they can apply. With that, I'm going to have to be the bad guy and the timekeeper here. We have actually gone pretty far with this. I am going to attempt to also save the chat file and get that to people because there's a lot of exchange of information in there. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Patty for moderating, Joyce Setta, who's off with News 12, doing a great job right now. Napoleon, Milady, Minerva, thank you. being great panelists. Um, we are a wealth of experiences and information, and we never have the time to talk to each other. So at least once a quarter, we get to do this. Um, you know, Renee is going to be on, on our next uh, uh, forum in April. Uh, I look forward to that. I look forward to seeing you. And again, thank you so much for talking about an important topic. And thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so much for being here today. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a great day.